No matter where you move in the world, there will always be a Grayson, Kara, Natalia. Let us begin with Grayson, who was 45, balding, and holding on to his white male privilege for dear life. From a wealthy family in Canada, he had a giant chip on his shoulder. He had not inherited his parents' luck and savvy for business, even though he inherited their wallet. So they did what most wealthy people do when they have a loser child, pay for his travels away. Yet Grayson was smart. He knew that his white male privilege may not level him up in any ladders in Canada, but in a Latino country, just maybe. So he went to Mexico. In Mexico, Grayson became a king to Montezuma's revenge. Everyone fell at his feet, and before I met him, I was told about him. One thing that I've noticed in traveling over 70 countries for the past decade is that the expat community will always have its kings and queens, the top five people that live to monitor WhatsApp chats, overcharge on services that their new nation, um, they, that the new nation they call home prices at at least 50% less, and will never say just how much they hate their new land unless drunk enough. It was something I noted on on the episode Gentriletti, and stuck out to me when I said it, but needed more time to analyze. For some people, moving to another place in the world is adventurous and just what they need to remember they are alive. But for people like Grayson, it's a reminder that somewhere else they failed to live, and it builds their resentment, even against their new home. The first time I met him, he was absolutely trashed. I did not think he was the same legend, especially because he did not have hair. And the and instead had the slim figure of a test tube. Not one curvature hit his body beyond the bottle of Corona he was dousing. He seemed so unput together, and my intuition always alerts me to the powerful men that secretly are more insecure than a dying lion surrounded by hyenas. In a way, that was Grayson, a dying lion that used his golden mane, or lack of, to assure surrounding hyenas never actually finished him off. He spent the night spewing racism, misogyny, and whatever hate speech could rile a Trump rally. I was shocked, and yet by the next day, him and the hyenas had forgotten everything and were surprisingly spruced for all the liver damage they had committed on themselves. Still, we can't forget Natalia and Kara. A proud, Natalia was a proud Zionist who had no problem praying for genocide on Palestine, except when she had run an art event. She was sharing her event with Kara, a young white woman from Portland whom had learned the ancient spiritual cleanses of the Mayans at a Hilton hotel in Tulum. Both were protective of their sectors. Kara charged $333 for a natal chart or $222 for a tarot reading and come close to offer either of her services and you were disinvited to any woman's brunch within a three-mile radius. Natalia ran music events for people with enough music industry pull or TikTok followings to have an audience pay $20 to see them sing on a rooftop. In between, she would sing her own songs, and it was a smart strategy. She got to keep the money and introduced herself like a goddess. Frankly, I made, um, I made hate on their hidden malices and rather conquistador energy, but they share something I want, the abil ability to claim who they want to be even if it is a lie or under quiet scrutiny. I had met all of them in a time when I sought a sense of community with the people of the world. To be honest, expat communities can be divided between those that try to colonize, those who fetishize, and the many that really just want to find joy. Of course, rotten apples are known more, but the reality is most people just feel lost and move around the world like myself because they never belonged never had a home or family, and just need to feel like at least nature will love them, even if it's in the Amazon forest. <laughs> Thus, I cannot hate on haters. Or, I can. But the truth is, I marvel at how they love themselves enough to make a community they have no connection with, beyond how that community connects with them. Sure, they are just users. But for those of us that are lost, there's something oddly and sickeningly attractive about that. So, Let's discuss. Um, you know, I've mentioned it in Gentriletti, and it's something that I really wanted to elaborate on and, and kept on thinking about. You know, I, and it's something that I have, met, I have mentioned it once in a, another episode. I don't remember. But it came up again in Gentriletti, and it's just this feeling of, I think I am envious of people that can claim who they want to be, even if they are not it. And it was something that I was laughing about with my friends because my dad would talk about his football career 
as if it was this thing that would have happened. And then when I found out, like, remember, he was a con artist. He just played football, like, from 13 to 15, and he's bow-legged. So he, his career was never going to launch, but he, he talks about football. Like, he was really going to the NFL. And I was like, but he he's bow-legged? He was bow-legged. He, was, he, was, he had very thin legs, and he would always wear, like, he was just a, a very thin guy, big belly, a thin guy, and he had very thin legs, but he always wore, like, baggy suit pants, so you didn't really notice he was bow-legged. Um, or just, like, a weird walker. Um, <laughs> and, but I, there was something about that ability to just act like you were the greatest star. Yeah. And I talked about it in Jesse in Japan, and I believe I posted that. Um, if not, I have to. Um, and it was about, you know, he, we went to a restaurant and he, there were these Japanese t um, tourists and he acted like he went to Japan and my father had never even left the country. And he was so convincing. They thought that he had seen more of Japan than them. And there's just something really enamoring about that in a way and fascinating about that. The problem is it, it has the tendency to be the greatest superpower to, for horrible people. Like, think about Lex Luthor and Superman. I'm a, a big comic book nerd. Like, Lex Luthor wants to be God and has no problem claiming it. And here you have Superman with the power of God, and he's, you know, dimming himself down and doubting and, and just really trying to be a good person, overwhelmingly so at times. And it's just this fascinating gift they have. Um, and with Grayson... What fascinated me with him, and I think a lot of empaths share this gift, um, I go into rooms and I will be introduced to the most powerful person and instantly I feel their darkness. And I have been in situations where that powerful person, and it's something that I mentioned in Gentility, my 10 in a room theory, where they are, they know how to contain themselves enough to be nice to nine people at best. But there's at least one or two of those 10 that they are going to absolutely eviscerate and humiliate. But because they were so good with the others, there will always be that murkiness and that inability to pin them down in terms of rightful consequences. My, I was my father's emotional scapegoat as well. So like he tortured me, but everybody else was fine. They were like, handle it. He's great with me. We, we're going to Europe. Um... And what I felt with Grayson was that energy. Like, uh, it's amazing, particularly because so many expats are American. They really do run on this high school click mentality of like, let's just group up. These are the cool kids. These are the nerds. And what makes me sad about that, that meanness, that clickishness is what I mentioned before. A lot of expats, I think they, I think every community we have the tendency to look at every community according to worst. You know, the worst of our communities represent the best of us. Latinos were constantly stapled in America's service or criminals, you know, we're either washing or stealing. And it's just like, we're all human. You're gonna meet everybody in every community because the ultimate community is humanity. And what I feel bad for expats is that a lot of them are like me. I. I was crying about it in therapy today. I realized I don't have a family. And I, I don't have a family. Like that's, I just don't, I don't have a I lost everybody. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little crying about that actually. I was crying about that in therapy today. And the truth is I never really did, but I had a really great lie. And losing that lie has been, very difficult for me. I grieve a lot because I really wanted a family. I am very family oriented by my nature, but I didn't get one. My dad was a F up. My mom's family was incredibly toxic. And I made the absolute mistake of starting to binge watch again, the season, uh, uh, the TV show lost and this huge, massive, big thought hit me in the head, and I'll probably save this for another episode, of just, I don't have any family, and 
spoiler alert, in the end, the main character, Jack, is dying and he goes to heaven in his head and he sees everybody that he'd ever loved and loved him. And I cried with my therapist because I'm like, I don't really have anybody up there waiting for me beyond my dog. And that's great. And I hope I get, you know, there's such a thing as a guardian angel just because I would like one person to say hi to me. You know, as sad as it is. In I think that's what, where they, there's a jealousy that I have for people like Natalia, who's this actually wants Palestine to undergo genocide. Like she's very pro-genocide. She doesn't uh, deny it. She is Zionist, but like, like evil Zionist scientist. She's really deranged, but she's very good at, at covering it up and getting opportunities for herself and making everyone think that she's a good person, but she takes the, the money and she takes over the concert to actually perform her own music. And it's incredibly strategic and it works. She gets opportunities. And the same thing with Kara, who, I mean, my God, you speak like an African language in front of Kara and she's just ready to, you know, reenact Tarzan or something. Like she's that girl. You know, fascinated, fetishizing everybody's culture and and history to somehow commodify it. And she went to like a Hilton Hotel weekend in Tulum, learned one Mayan practice and has been getting wealthy off, off of it ever since. And it's like, well, you know, I'm, not a, I'm here struggling with my poverty vows, so I don't know how much I can judge. But at the same time, it does feel skeevy. And I think it feels skeevy because of something that a lot of people complain with in, in expats and gentrification and me in terms of my exes, <laughs> this ability to use people and have no connection to them, to take love and just think because you took someone else's love that in some ways you were showing gratitude or loving them back. It's like I gave you my heart, you took it and you cheated on me. You know, great job, John Mulaney. Um, <laughs> but it, it's that energy, that coldness. And it was something I always envied in my dad, how cold he was. Like evil and scandalous and salacious and shameless. And I mean, I think I, I think my, my mother and her family just, they raised children to feel guilty for breathing too hard or chewing too loud. And here was this guy who was absolutely evil and everybody apologized for him, to him, made excuses for him. And I felt so breathless. I felt like if I tripped on the dining room table, I, I would get called klutzy and how I never look. And I almost smashed the center, like I boom, 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 boom. And here was this guy who was committing fraud. And it's like, oh, God, really hope he heals himself. And that juxtaposition like totally hammered my head and fried my brains. Like it's something that I'm really trying to heal with because it makes me wonder if I was set up to be alone. If I was set up to be like that lost episode, except when I die, I don't get the the aftermath of people who loved me because no one did. They used me. I comforted them, but they didn't have any connection with me. And they didn't have any connection with me because they were just focused on claiming who they were not and using everybody they can to actually become it. And I, as by my nature as an empath, but because my father is a narcissist, I naturally attract those people, which is why I'm trying to change my nature. And I'm naturally admiring them in a very sick, twisted way. I admire their ability to shake everything off or not even invest. And the thing about Grayson was I met him the first time he was trashed. Oh my God, he was absolutely pulling his spiritual pants down and pooping on Mexico. And I mentioned in a gentiletti. And I think it's something that my dad had. I, I, one of the reasons I think my father did not love me. 
beyond the fact that he was a horrible human being, I mean, how do you not love a baby, is the resentment he had at me kind of revealing to him that he was not who he thought he was. And he was never going to have the life he actually wanted, which was to be with my mom. Because he only had me because he really wanted her. And he was obsessed with her. And I felt like the way Grayson just pooped on Mexico was out of resentment. Out of resentment. And it, it makes me think of, you know, often when we talk about the colonizers and conquistadors, they're either painted as these, like, adventurous men that just know how to travel, or these, like, you know, sexually addicted goat men that just absolutely pillaged and raped, which they did. But there were also a lot of them, one of the great ironies that I think people ignore when it comes to talking about colonization is that these were men that suffered great injustice in their own home countries that were uneducated, unhealthy, often unjustly imprisoned because, I mean, that was the heartbeat of Australia's colonization. They just literally opened up prisons and said, you want to head out? And they were separated by from their families because they were just so poor and inaccessed. And they're like the only and literally their king just told them hey the only way you're going to make it in this world is if i ship you to somewhere you never know you ready to go and no goodbyes no mental adjustments nothing and it makes me wonder if part of the level of vitriol i mean if you read the things columbus did to to dainos to my people oof Oofed. I mean, just pure evil, pure, sick, twisted evil. And the way things he was saying, Grayson, that night, it was evil and it was, it was deviant and it was out of anger and sadness, not just hatefulness, but the hatefulness of why am I here? Why did my king kick me out, aka his parents? Why? Am I barely succeeding in a place where I'm privileged and I barely succeeded in another place and I didn't succeed in another place where I really am privileged, you know, because that, it, again, I brought up a, a previous episode of D'Andrew. I wrote about how I made D'Andrew reviews it all out of revenge uh, because uh, this 55-year-old white guy hired me to work for free covering Broadway shows, and when I got really popular and got personal requests, he fired me. And he said, basically, you're doing too well, and it's not fair. <laughs> Those are actually direct quotes from that email. And I think there's a mutual resentment. I am resentful of privilege. I'm resentful of my dad for his ability to use his maleness to get away with crime, literal crime, for his ability to consistently and boldly go for resources he doesn't deserve when he's bow-legged and not talented. <laughs> like, Natalia's not that great, but she goes for it. Um, Kara, I couldn't, I don't even think she could catch a spirit with a Ouija board. But she is charging that 333 and that 222 and just talking up a storm to anybody with ears in a spiritual plight. And I don't condone their behavior. I certainly don't support or approve of their intentions. But I've mentioned it before that daddy recovery is me trying to figure out how to center myself in my life in a way where I could continue to love and help and heal others, but also like finally do that for me. Because if I don't love myself, if I don't heal myself, I just end up supporting the Natalias and the Karas and the Graysons of the world. Because I may look at them with scrutiny now, but those were the people that were my friends and that they were my bosses and my lovers. And, I, and they were that because again, I think we paint too much with general brushes sometimes. 
and a lot of expats or a lot of people that move or just general humanity. I always say there's like three groups. Often we do, you know, you're either liberal or conservative. You're either an influencer or a celebrity. And I, we always forget the subgroups or, or the big subgroup, right? And most people were just watchers. We're just people that are just desperate to have a sense of community. And we, we try to build it out of insecurity because we think we know love or that love is just love. And, and somehow the insecurity will fade away the more we put ourselves out there. But you have to put yourself out there correctly. And these people are in their own way. My father just wanted money and all he had to do was scam and he got it. He got it. That's all he wanted. He got what he wanted. And I want depth, but I do want to be the center. I do want to be the one, the shaker and mover. I want to be the boss, but I want to be the loving boss. And how to match that grace and energy without hatefulness and resentment. Because that's what I really felt when he had that breakdown, which apparently he has every time he gets drunk. I don't know how he hasn't been shipped somewhere. Um, and God, it's something I mentioned in Gentiletti. Expats get obliterated. I mean, absolutely obliterated. And it's so sad because I, I think they share my feeling of lostness. They just don't share my humility to admit it. I dated a director and he was taught, uh, he, you would have thought he was Martin Scorsese. And he barely made a documentary film when he was 18. And it's that kind of, you know, you're still working and you moved away from this location because it didn't, you felt it didn't lead you, let you succeed. And yet you still maneuver under its mentality of looking like the most successful person to be a dud. You don't move around the world and choose this life of inherent instability unless you are adventurous or you are just a sad person trying to revive. And both can look one and the same. I've always been adventurous, but I've also been sad. And my adventures revive me, revive me enough to see where I should settle, how I should settle in being me. And these are people that will never admit that, but they sure will commodify it. And there's something gross about that, undeniably so. So check out daddyrecovery.com for my stories. Check out the Andrew Reviews at all for my reviews. Follow me on all platforms. And I've got plans, baby. I've got plans. <laughs> Thank you for following me.